Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Good morning teacher. <laughs> uh, so I, I have a few uh, introductory uh, comments to make, but before I do, can the panelists on, on Sheila's panel, the first panel, come up here so we can get started right immediately? Um, so I am uh, Peter Zimroth. I am the director of the Center on Civil Justice here at NYU Law School. I want to welcome everybody for, uh, who's here today, and, and uh, bit, we're very happy uh, that you're here. This is the first of two big conferences that the Center is, is, uh, uh, is sponsoring this fall. Uh, just a brief plug for the second of those, which is a conference on uh, artificial intelligence in a democratic society on November 30 and uh, December 1, uh, just uh, you know, a short time uh, from now. This should be a very exciting conference. We hope uh, you all can come back. And as you know, uh, this conference is uh, to mark the 50th anniversary uh, of the MDL. Uh, before we uh, begin, I want to uh, acknowledge a few people. Uh, first, uh, our two uh, uh, partners at, uh, at this, uh, sponsoring this conference from Yale, uh, Judith Resnick, who I saw Judith here. Where is Judith? Okay, uh, Judith, and uh, also Abby Gluck, who's not here this morning, but will be here uh, later in the conference. They are the, uh, at the Lyman Center and the Solomon Center at the Yale Law School. I want to thank the, Judy and please convey this to Abby. Thank you so much uh, for working with us and helping us plan uh, this event. I want to also uh, thank the staff of the center, particularly David Siffert, who, where is David? <laughs> David Siffert is right here, uh, and Shirley Dang, uh, who's standing back there. Uh, they are people who you can rely on if you need anything, if you have any questions, uh, just uh, ask them. Um, and last, I wanted to thank our uh, faculty co-directors uh, who are here, uh, Sam Sakharov, where's Sam? Sam is, is right here. Uh, Jeff Miller, I didn't see Jeff here uh, today. I think he said he was coming a little later. Arthur Miller, who's sitting all the way to my left, and uh, Troy McKenzie, who's uh, also going to be here uh, later uh, in this conference. Uh, <coughs> uh, we are blessed with a, not just the faculty co-directors, but a really a superb group of fa of uh, uh, advi of advisors, uh, some of whom will be in and out at this conference, and I'll uh, ask them to introduce them. To, they'll have tags on. You'll see who they are, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves uh, to you, or you to introduce yourselves to them. <clears throat> so, as everybody here knows, uh, 2018 marks the 50th anniversary. Uh, of the MDL, uh, and I, uh, something at some time ago, I'm not sure exactly where I heard this, Arthur Miller, who, uh, uh, who was also at the birth of the MDL, but also uh, at the, um, uh, the creation of Rule 23, said that uh, Rule 23, which was, I think, just two years before uh, the creation of the MDL. At that time, all the people who were, or many of the people uh, who were talking about Rule 23 uh, thought of it as, uh, thought of the MDL as a, I think his phrase was a nothing burger. Uh, at least that's how I, uh, as how, how I recall. Well, that uh, prediction, or uh, it, it turned out, as we all know, to be wildly wrong. Uh, <laughs> By 2014, uh, the MDL constituted upwards of 40% of the federal docket. I, uh, 
and the impact of MDL on the judiciary, on the, on the justice system, and, and on our country uh, has been enormous, uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about uh, today. Uh, <clears throat> before I uh, introduce uh, the first panelist, uh, first chair, which is Sheila, <laughs> Sheila I want to uh, talk, just mention a few housekeeping things. First, um, you all have uh, this uh, brochure, and so you know when the, uh, the order of the, of the panels, and I would ask that the moderator of the panel come up to the podium like five minutes before the uh, panelists to start just so we can talk about any uh, any uh, last minute issues? Uh, by the way, I'll stop now because Abby Gluck, who, uh, who I thanked a minute ago, Abby, uh, just came in, so say hello, thank you. I've already thanked Judith in person, now I thank you in person. Um, so that's the first thing. And the second, it would be good if all the panelists were actually seated, uh, uh, you know, before the uh, at the time that we're about to get started. And the, uh, the reason for that is we have a very full program and we want to make sure uh, that things move along so that, so that there is time for uh, discussion, not only discussion among the panelists, but discussion with the people in the audience. Because some of the people in the audience who are not on the panel could just as easily have been on the panels uh, they are as expert as the uh, as some of the panelists. So, uh, so that's the first thing. Second of all, the format of each of these panels will they won't all be the same. Some will be a series of individual presentations, and then a conversation among the panelists and the, and also the people in the uh, in the room. And some will have uh, a paper or maybe two papers, uh, academic papers or, uh, or other papers that will be the focus of the conversation. So the uh, chair of the panel, the moderator of the panel will, uh, will describe what's going to happen. Uh, anybody here who has signed up for CLE, please make sure that you sign out, otherwise uh, it'll be difficult to get you your credit. And uh, lunch, I should say, you see on, your, on the schedule, lunch is from 12 to 1.30, but it's served here. We will have lunch here for everybody so that you can stay and, I mean, you don't have to, but uh, talk uh, uh, with each other and, uh, and do whatever else you want to do. But, uh, so that'll be from 12 to 1.30. And one final announcement, which is that tomorrow morning, the uh, start time might be delayed a, a little bit uh, because of the uh, disruption in transportation all along the East Coast. Uh, we'll have to see later in the day uh, whether it makes sense to do that. But it will, if it's postponed, we'll tell you uh, this afternoon, and it'll be postponed only for by, like a half an hour. So uh, uh, that's it. So the first panel is chaired by um, Sheila Birnbaum. And uh, I don't think I need to say much about Sheila. Uh, she is uh, the king, the queen, <laughs> uh, both of uh, of complex uh, litigation, in, at least in terms of, of the defense bar. And I think it's fair to say, uh, many people have said, and I, I agree with this, that she, uh, at least, she invented uh, this field of law, at least as far as big firm uh, practice is concerned. Uh, she is now a partner at Deckert and uh, is lead attorney in the ongoing opioid uh, litigation. Sheila? Thanks. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel here um, from academia, from 
the defense bar, uh, and uh, uh, I guess Ken Feinberg, who stands out by himself. He has no bar, uh, but a name everybody knows. Uh, and uh, we're, we're going to give you a smorgasbord of multi-district aggregation. Um, uh, there's going to be a little historical pieces. There's going to be um, a lot of give and take, and uh, we're going to uh, leave it open for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, we do have a very experienced audience as well. So we're not going to go through uh, long um, uh, introductions because that'll take too much time because everybody uh, has these incredible credentials. Uh, we're going to start off with Alexandra, who is going to give us a little historical overview, uh, and then we'll move to some of the other topics. Uh, so, Alexandra. Thanks, Sheila. Um, so I just want to say a few words about what I see as the... Move it closer. Move it closer to you. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, what I see as the uh, biggest conceptual development uh, with respect to MDLs over the last um, 50 years, um, and I would say that is um, an understanding aggregate litigation as a continuum rather than a set of discrete uh, topics. So our panel is called, I think, class actions, uh, MDL, and bankruptcy. And um, I think when the MDL was first created, initially by a court uh, rule and ultimately by statute, as Andrew has, uh, Brat has written about, um, combining cases under the auspices of an MDL was considered a completely different animal um, on the one hand than uh, tort pl plaintiffs whose cases were being uh, aggregated in, um, at that time, uh, private, uh, through private aggregations. Um, uh, cases that were being aggregated through uh, bankruptcy um, and ultimately the class action rule uh, in which cases are certified by a judge. And these were understood as separate spheres. Um, but I, I think that that understanding of, of the relationship between modes of aggregation uh, has really changed so that today uh, class actions and bankruptcy um, are understood not as separate spheres but rather as overlapping and merging methods for resolving large-scale, multi-plaintiff disputes. Um, and the culmination, I think, of this interconnected view uh, was the ALI principles of the law of aggregate litigation, um, which conceived of aggregation as a phenomenon and the doctrinal structured, structures uh, in which aggregation, aggregated cases are resolved um, really as the forms that aggregation can take rather than as separate spheres. Um, and the pioneer, uh, or at least to my mind, one of the key pioneers of this changing perception is Sam Zakharoff, uh, who was uh, the reporter of the ALI project, uh, and whose work both about present doctrine um, and, uh, his, and his historical work uh, shows this interrelationship. So one article that Sam has written with uh, John Witt, who's here, that I really like and that helped me understand better these relationships, uh, shows how um, aggregation was used privately by insurers and lawyers in the Industrial Revolution um, uh, in order to resolve large masses of cases. That article is called The Inevitability of Aggregation, if you haven't read it. Um, and one of the things that that article brought to my attention that I began to think about was the way in which public and private forms of dispute resolution are, are inextricable in the aggregation context. Um, and the modern equivalent to what they describe uh, may be these mass tort MDLs um, at which res ultimately resolve cases through claims resolution facilities, a kind of alternative dispute resolution regime uh, that is the result either of a negotiated aggregate settlement uh, or more recently, uh, class action. I'm sure Chris can tell us all about how that's done. Um, and so the ALI project's concept conceptual contribution was to understand that all of these forms are subsets of one thing, uh, claim aggregation, and these are just different templates for achieving uh, that goal. Uh, and that's why it makes sense, for example, in a complex litigation course to teach a bankruptcy case such as in -ray combustion engineering, just to give a concrete example. And I think the same fundamental issues um, arise in all of these aggregations, and they are 
How do you achieve horizontal equity between claimants or plaintiffs? Uh, how do you solve the principal agent problem between lead counsel and many claimants? Um, and how do you achieve global peace in one forum? Um, and so an example of all of these coming together, um, a case, you know, we, we might have a situation where a case begins as an MDL, then it's certified as a class action. It may also lead to bankruptcy, depending on the situation. And the opioids litigation, I think, is a good example of all of these forms um, in one giant uh, aggregation. Um, and so understanding these different forms is fundamentally part of the same thing um, is both an intellectual contribution, um, but it's also one with a real practical payoff because it opens up avenues for resolving masses of cases that might have seemed closed if you saw each of these as a separate sphere. So with that, I'll end and move to the present. Thank you. Um, that sort of sets the stage um, that, uh, that uh, we're going to take off from, from this. Uh, our next uh, speaker is going to be Bob Klonoff, who's uh, uh, written a great deal about class actions and about mass torts. And um, we're going to, Bob's going to talk about the pending potential legislation uh, that is going to uh, potentially affect mass torts if it gets passed uh, through the advisory committee and then uh, the Judicial Council and the legislature. Uh, and it raises the issues of some of the problems that the legislation uh, is uh, potentially trying to resolve. And, and I think Chris Seeger is then going to give some comments uh, from the plaintiff's point of view on some of these uh, suggested legislative moves. Bob? Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about what the Civil Rules Committee is currently doing uh, in the MDL area. Uh, I served on the committee uh, for six years and was uh, then, then term limited out. I was involved in the class action process, but I've been following the MDL process very carefully. Um, and so I wanted to give a sense of, of what's going on there. Um, before I do that, though, I want to briefly mention um, H.R. 985, which is the House bill. Uh, passed the House uh, very narrowly back in uh, 2017, and although most of the publicity has been about class actions, um, it would also affect MDL, uh, primarily personal injury MDL. Um, so it would require upfront disclosure of medical records and other information um, in every individual case. Um, it would essentially cap the attorney's fee awards by providing that the individual plaintiffs must recover no less than 80% uh, of the total recovery, and it provides for discretionary appeals for a whole variety of, of rulings. Um, it doesn't look like it's making serious headway at the present time in the Senate, um, but that's anyone's guess. Um, the uh, Rules Committee has formed a special subcommittee focusing on, on MDLs. Um, back in 2017, and the members of the committee, uh, the chair is Judge Michael Dow from the Northern District of Illinois, uh, Judge Joan Erickson from the District of Minnesota. There are two defense lawyers on the committee, in the subcommittee, Virginia Seitz of Sidley and Austin, John Barquette of Chicardi, and then for the plaintiffs, uh, Arianna Tadler and Parker Foles. Arianna's with Milberg, Tadler and Parker's with Sussman Godfrey. And I, I would just say up front that anyone who has any interest in any of these issues in MDL or any of the other issues should feel free to contact any member of the subcommittee. That information will, will be reviewed carefully and it will be distributed to other members uh, of the subcommittee. The subcommittee has been writing circuit. They've gone to conferences all over the United States put on by Duke, Emory, AAJ, and others. Um, and they have two pending conferences that they'll be attending as part of their work. One is the MDL Transfer Judges Conference on October 29th, and then the George Washington University Conference on Third Party Funding on November 2nd. Um, and they're hoping both in the formal presentations and in sidebar conversations to get more uh, input. And let, let me say just up front that the, almost all of the input has come from the defense bar. And that's why I want Chris to 
uh, interject here on the significance of some of these proposals. I'm surprised, number one, that the plaintiff bar hasn't been more active in its own proposals, and I'm even more surprised that they're not commenting in public documents on the defense proposals, which would be dramatic. And so, Chris, I think, um, I'm hoping as I go through the individual issues that are facing the committee, it can talk about which ones are truly important uh, and why. I mean, it might be worth just noting, <clears throat> I was surprised to hear the point you just made that there's not much in there from the plaintiff's bar. I mean, and I guess on one hand that really shocks me, and on the other hand it may not because we're not really as well organized as the corporate interests on the other side who, that work through the Chamber of Commerce and uh, all these other organizations. We don't really have that. Now, the comeback would be you, you have the uh, you have AAJ. And I don't want to be too critical of AAJ, but the, but, the, but the primary membership of AAJ doesn't really practice in this area. They're not dealing with complex litigation, mass torts, and class actions. Much, much of that is, you know, our single incident personal injury cases, medical malpractice type cases. So um, I know that there is something in there from AAJ, but it's probably not reflecting um, the thoughts of people who actually live in this room. So I, now, there might be another it? reason, Chris. The plaintiffs have everything they want. <laughs> <laughs> and they're very happy with the system they have. Yeah. So, well, if that's uh, true, we, they, should be, they should be commenting on the defense proposal. They, and, and they probably yeah. will if they think Well, then we'd have some, if you were right, we'd have a lot to protect. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's some threshold issues that we really didn't face in the class action rulemaking. As people know, the new class action rules are due to take effect on on December 1st. The MDL process is different because there's really a threshold question of whether or not changes to the MDL process are suitable for rule change or whether that should be done through legislation. There's another question on a lot of these proposals as to whether or not they violate uh, the Rules Enabling Act. So there's a real threshold question, I think, whether the subcommittee is going to end up proposing anything at the end of, of this process. Um, or we'll just leave it to Congress or to case-by-case -case adjudication. Um, so the big concern that you'll see if you look at the public record so far on what the subcommittee is doing is the defense concern that, as they put it, the MDL process uh, tr attracts meritless claims, uh, and then they then become parked in the MDL and are utilized solely for settlement purposes without um, any determination of whether, in fact, those claims have merit. Um, so the first topic that uh, the subcommittee is addressing along those lines is the process in a lot of MDLs to have master complaints and answers. And there are questions about whether uh, master complaints should be provided for uh, in the federal rules, what purpose do they serve. Um, and the defense bar has specifically proposed that um, master complaints should be subject to Rule 7. They should be specifically mentioned as a pleading in the rules um, and that they're subject to the requirements of Rules 8, 9, 11, and 12, or in other words, that uh, motions to dismiss can be filed uh, based on uh, those master complaints. Do you want, you want to talk about that issue? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm probably not the, the, I haven't really had an opportunity to think that through. I will tell you my, generally, I'm not a big fan of master complaints for, or for lots of reasons. Um, we've used them in some cases, we haven't in others. You know, there's no one size fits all approach. Um, so it's kind of hard to respond to that particular criticism in a, in a vacuum. I'd have to see, you know, I'd have to think a little more about that one. Yeah, can I not just comment that master complaints have their place, yeah. but they shouldn't, they, they could exist, it seems to me, as the initial pleading, but that doesn't give you any real information. Uh, from the defense point of view, that's just the opening bid. Yeah. And then you really have to get to the information. So I think some of the other mm -hmm. I issues that you're going to raise, Bob, is going to be more important sure. than the question of whether we have master complaints or individual complaints. And not just that. So in the in yeah. a class action context, the use of a master complaint will serve a, a particular type of purpose. In the mass tort context, where you've got claims from basically all 50 states, it's a whole different animal. So, so I think the heart of what the defense bar is proposing is the upfront information discovery, automatic discovery of information about every single case uh, in the MDL that um, even where you just have a master complaint, there'd be requirements that uh, an individual pleading of some sort be filed for every single case, identifying 
the evidence that's being relied on, and that could form a basis for a motion to dismiss. Um, another proposal would put that requirement in the initial disclosures under Rule 26, but the point is, is that all of this information would be available up front. Yeah, so, so this is an area that I do have, um, I do have something to say about, because it ha it leading these litigations, there, it's become very easy to get cases. I mean, pretty much you just put up a, a website and you're gonna get a lot of cases. There is some, and I, have, I think I have to be really fair about this, there is some fair criticism that when an MDL is set up, it gets flooded with all different types of cases. Some of them are great and some of them are not so great. So I have some sympathy on this point, but this is, this is something that I think that the parties can work through. I'll give you an example. It's, first of all, the problem is never as big as what I hear from my, my friends on the, on the defense side. They give in numbers of 30, 40, 50 percent of meritless cases, and I don't think they're just talking about cases that don't have documentation. I think they're making a judgment that there are cases that shouldn't have been filed, and that's not, that's, that's a problem I mean, if, in prejudging the cases. But if we're just talking about documentation, I don't see a major problem with a plaintiff at some point early on in the case coming up with some basic documentation like a medical record showing that you were on the drug or a, a medical record indicating that you have at least suffered the type of injury that's at issue. In the most recent litigation that I'm involved with, which is uh, one of the most recent ones in the proton pump inhibitor litigation, we, the plaintiffs, actually proposed a fact sheet that would require the submission of those documents. Because if you're, if you're in a leadership committee, the last thing you really want to do is have cases that, where people don't even have proof of use or injury filed on the docket because it be, they become problems for all, all kinds of reasons. They become a problem because they get sucked into a bellwether process and wind up with cases being dismissed that shouldn't have been there, which is a big problem and a waste of time and money on the lawyers on both sides working cases up like that. They become a problem at, at the end if the defendant wants to settle because you don't know what the denominator is. If it's, you know, if the case involves 10,000 cases or 5,000 cases or there's some percentage of that. So there are, to there, there are big problems here, but I, you know, I don't know what a, I mean, I'm not sure. Obviously my concern is that when, when, you, when this gets into the rules process, I've seen, I've seen many instances of uh, rules trying to solve problems and create new ones. This is one I think that could be really implemented by judges and the parties. I mean, if, a, if judges said, you know, go work this out, but have at least some minimal proof that the person should be here, proof of a, that you took the drug. And that's, you know, that, that may not sound like a much, much to people sitting here, but in the Vioxx litigation that involved about 30,000 filed claims, there were a couple thousand claims of people that didn't take you know, Vioxx. They, weren't, they couldn't produce a medical record that they even took the drug. We can solve that up front. Or if the Vioxx litigation, for example, deals with heart attacks being caused by a painkiller, then you should have suffered at least a, you know, a heart injury. There were some claims that were filed that ha had to do with bones breaking or wound healing, and there were things that just were not being worked up in the litigation. You can screen those out very early, but I, I just don't see this as the subject for a rule. This is something that can just be done by, you know, time and experience, you, know, you but, learn. But the problem is, Chris, that you choose your cases, you screen your cases, and there are a lot of lawyers in the United States that do neither, and they just put up right. a website, people sign up, and, that, and they don't do anything more because they know they're gonna be in the MDL, and no one's gonna require that information, or a lot of judges will not. So without a rule, there is always a fight, and that, for, for some people, that fight is time consuming, it, it, and, and, and doesn't get to what I think you would agree, and I would agree, is let's see what cases there really are, and let's get rid of all the stuff that's not there, so we don't have thousands of cases. So, so let, me, let me just say, you know, for the people in the audience who may look at this and say either, well, why wasn't this done here, and why was it done there? When you propose this as a plaintiff's lawyer, you get a lot of pushback from your colleagues. Not all of them are looking to, to beat the system with meritless claims, but there are a number of plaintiff's lawyers that take on a significant amount of clients. I mean, if you are in a litigation and you've got hundreds of clients and there's a requirement that medical records get produced in the first 60 days of the complaint being filed, there's a big burden involved there in actually getting those records. And I'm, and I'm telling you, there are a number of firms that do this stuff very well and legitimately can get those records, but maybe not in those time constraints. So if you create a process where this can be done and there can be some, you know, some, some, you know, some, 
something built in where those timelines can be extended for people who have a hard time getting medical records, which isn't the easiest thing in the world, believe it or not. I mean, much of that stuff you can get in a few weeks, but there are cases where people are ordering records from small pharmacies that you know, go, may go back years and they can't get those. But if you can build in protections for people in that respect, I, I think you can really wean out the cases, Sheila, that you're talking about, which are the ones that really just shouldn't have been filed in the first place. Can I just ask Ken to jump in here because um, just to get everybody involved. Uh, Ken has done more settlements and more claims facilities than anyone in the United States. And uh, he understands, I think, the necessity for information. Um, and we'll, we'll get back to some more of these, Bob, and then, and then let's get author into this discussion as well. Um, uh, but especially the BP settlement, Ken, or any of the others you want to talk about, and um, you can talk about information or you can talk about anything else you want. Notice the, uh, the uh, <laughs> title of this panel. Theory of aggregation, class actions, MDLs, bankruptcies, and more. And more. Well, I'm the and more. <laughs> I've been added here for the and more. You're going to put some life into the and more. So every once in a while in this country, very, very rare, you do get an and more aggregative tool. The 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund. Perfect example. You'll never see it again. But it worked. Congress didn't want to go through this. Congress said, have Feinberg design and administer a separate extrajudicial program to aggregate the claims and resolve them in 33 months. Well, we settled 5,300 cases and got releases and that was that. BP oil spill, BP fronted $20 billion to President Obama. And the Obama administration said, we don't want to go through all of this class action New Orleans stuff. Let Feinberg set up an aggregative alternative, a claims program. People will come in, they'll get paid, they'll sign a release. We closed out, um, in the first year we paid out um, about $200 million before the first litigation was even scheduled by Judge Barbier. It worked. The GM ignition switches. GM didn't want to litigate those cases, didn't want to go to class actions, didn't want to go to the courts. Have Feinberg set up a separate aggregative claims program. So those are just three examples. Now, I can't get very excited about this <laughs> because they are so rare. <clears throat> the, the, these cases, these aberrations that I go through are exceedingly rare. 9-11, GM, BP, one every eight years almost. You've got to have $20 billion to front if you're BP and you want to do a program like this. 9-11 was taxpayer money. Taxpayer money. We paid out $7.1 billion of the taxpayers, uh, of taxpayer dollars. That was just the beginning? Yeah, now there's a drug with the add-on. You'll never see that again, nor should you. And GM, GM was getting pilloried in Congress, so Feinberg set up a plan. Now these programs, under the guise of efficiency, speed, cost effectiveness, certainty, they work. Now oh, you pay a heavy price. There are no appeals. There are no committees. There's no second guessing. Whatever Ken says, and uh, we delegate to him, and God bless. Well, that's not really the way the law should develop. And that's why you see these so rare. Now, I want to make one other point. To me, I'm a, you know, I'm a big student of Arthur Miller and Jack Weinstein in Brooklyn. And the view that the Rule 23 class action, uh, unfortunately, is not being used as effectively as it could. Well, all right. So Congress says we don't even have Rule 23, really. So a, a claims program. BP says that that class action will take forever and let's just get rid of as many claims as we can. And GM said we don't even want to go to court. We don't want anything to do with it. Private, confidential, close out the cases. $600 million paid out for 124 deaths, ignition switch, and about 270 physical injuries in about 16 months. It works. But they're so 
um, costly to the defendant to front that type of money. Insurance plays no role in any of this, see. That's between the insured and the insurer. Don't get me in the middle of that. I'm paying the claims. So BP says just pay it. We'll get contribution from our insurers, you know, if and when. So that's sort of the and more. And I must say, uh, I don't really think during the course of today and tomorrow a whole lot of time is going to be spent on the and more because the programs, as I say, are so rare that th they're really a precedent for nothing. Instead, it would be nice if people listened to Arthur and Jack Weinstein and Elizabeth Cabreza, who's right here, who I think probably is more of an advocate for Rule 23 on behalf of plaintiffs than anybody in the United States. But to a certain extent, we're whistling in the wind, and that's why if I get a call from President Bush, 9-11, or President Obama, BP, um, you don't really say, like, I'm too busy or something. You do it. And uh, they work, and they're history. They're really history. But they're an interesting contrast to some of this technical discussion that's going on today. But the only thing I disagree with, Ken, is I don't think it's history. I think there are going to be more of these uh, when there are large catastrophes one way or another. I think more defendants would rather go down this path than the path they're going down now in some of the litigations they're in. So um, uh, I, I do agree with you that these are incredibly interesting examples, but I don't think that's the end. Arthur, what do you think? Arthur? <laughs> On anything. Well, I, I was minding my own business at the Metropolitan Opera last night, <laughs> watching Aida and Amneris fight over Rodemais, when I start getting emails from Klonoff, who says, why don't you join the panel tomorrow? You know, it's 10 o'clock at night which explains why I have a f <laughs> sort of a f freely drawn. I didn't know it opposed the suggestion of us. Uh, Klonoff even bribed me. He, he brought me some Oregon coffee, <laughs> which he knows I adore. But why he brought me Oregon coffee from a mate called Sleepy Monk. <laughs> That mystifies me. So, I'll, I'll, just, re I'll just react to, to what I've heard so far. Ken always reminds me of the TV series, Let Saul Do It. <laughs> Let Ken do it. Uh, although I do agree with him, he, he's in a niche situation that is dependent on large-scale events that have a public, real public policy character. And um, it, it's, it isn't something we should focus on. Then I'm reminded of the fact, when I hear the chit-chat from Klonoff about what's going on with regard to the multi-district litigation subcommittee, this complaint about, and Sheila, you're uh, an unindicted co-conspirator on this, <laughs> this constant refrain, it'll breed meritous litigation. And uh, that took me back to 1961 <laughs> and the meetings of the Rules Advisory Committee which I sat in as Ben Kaplan's young associate and listened to the defense interests within the committee because the committee meetings were not transparent in those days. It was only the committee, but there were defense lawyers on the committee and much of this is not in the record. It was done over lunch, it was done at dinner, it was done by telephone call. And the constant refrain in 1961 was, class actions, they are going to breed meritless, lit meritless litigation. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, 
you know, it's like watching a bad movie for the 14th time. Or a broken record. <laughs> or a broken record, whatever your metaphor wants to be. So that's my reaction to Klonoff. Uh, it's not a reaction to him. I'm just sick and tired of hearing the defense people whine about Meredith. I mean, defense interests have never seen a meritorious case. Never. <laughs> Since 1961, they've never seen it. Then uh, Alexei. Uh, Alexei said something that I think is really important. It's embedded in the work that uh, Sam and Bob did on aggregate litigation. It's time to put the pieces together. Uh, th this notion that we're looking at a scattergram of events and phenomena is sort of ludicrous. Uh, we're, we're dealing with mass claim management. And Sam, uh, I'm reminded of the integration of a case that you had a little toe in the water on, and I had a toe in the water on, what is it, 25 or 30 years ago, that is still going on. It will outlast us. And that's the Semino asbestos litigation. It starts out as a class action, which was the name of the game back then. And it gets certified. I forget the date. I think it was certified as a class in 1990. And there's an adjudication of certifiability. There's an adjudication of a variety of things. And of course, that didn't end it. It goes on and on through phases. Bob Parker trying to solve the problem of mass asbestos cases. He can't possibly try over 3,000 cases. He was then on the di district court. So he devises trial plan after trial plan. And the Fifth Circuit, with that grace, graciousness of the old fifth, sort of an 18th century style, keep whacking the trial plan down. So it keeps coming back. It gets relitigated. And then it goes, when PPG is unhappy about it, it's now 98, maybe it's 03, I don't know, time merges. They go to the multi-district litigation panel. Here, here's a case Bob Parker has been working on for much of his useful life. And PPG pulls it to go over to multi-district. Well, that didn't work. The panel didn't want it. So PPG comes back and says, OK, we'll declare bankruptcy. Troy, that's your bag. It's now your case. So it's, go it's gone through a class action. Nobody, nobody, it's law of the case. It's race judicata or collateral estoppel now on the class certification, maybe on damages. But it's gone through every one of the pieces on the board. And it's now, what, 30 years, Sam? It's about 30 years. And guess where it is now? Guess where it is now? It's something none of you have mentioned. It's in arbitration. <laughs> hmm? <clears throat> Isn't this the biggest shell game of all time? Class action, move it over to multi-district. Multi-district, move it over to bankruptcy. Bankruptcy, move it over to arbitration. Now, arbitration is a phenomenon whose dimension we do not yet know. Arbitration is likely to take off multi-district, off class action, off bankruptcy, everything except mass torts. What are you going to do about that? In other words, I was there and worked on 23. And call one. me. Why don't you call me? Hmm? <laughs> call Saul. You said, you said a niche? Call me. <laughs> uh, Chris, let me, let me uh, get you back into the conversation, you and Bob. Uh, uh, we, we, we get, we're giving you some ethics uh, credit, so we, like we really have to uh, pass on some of the ethics issues. And, uh, uh, you know, this is hard to get ethics credit, so I don't want anyone to say we didn't give you what we advertised. Uh, so, uh, 
Chris, you want to raise some of the ethical issues uh, that you had in Vioxx and some other cases, uh, and then we can all try to comment on it. Uh, well, I didn't think there were any ethical issues in the <laughs> yeah, I and we worked very <laughs> hard to make sure there weren't. Yeah. Um, but, but others complained about it, and there are still people in academ academia that refer to it as a course of agreement and unethical aspects. What they're particularly talking about is that there was a provision in the agreement that said if you recommend, um, you have to, as a lawyer, if you accept the settlement, you have to recommend it to all your clients. Now that's a recommendation. I don't think anybody thought that was a big deal. I didn't either because I spent, an, we spent, I shouldn't say me, I was on a committee. We spent an entire year negotiating an almost $5 billion settlement that we thought was ultimately a very rich settlement. The way I look at these settlements every time I try to get to a number in my head is I'm thinking based on the merits of the case, you're standing on the courthouse steps about to walk in and pick a jury. Do you take that number and eliminate the risk? And that's kind of the, the balancing test in my head. I felt Vioxx passed that test and then some. I thought it was very rich. So I didn't think that anyone would have a problem. We, and also, we went around the country talking to lawyers. And for every lawyer that said, and some of them did say, I've got this one case. I've got this one case. It's worth millions. We created in the settlement an extraordinary injury fund that for anybody with large economic loss or had a really, just this really extreme personal injury, these personal injury damages, they would be able to go into this additional fund to get more money. So we thought that was a safety valve. Um, the other part of it was that if, if you had a client that didn't want the settlement, you could, you could go forward, but you would have to waive your fee interest in the case that was being pulled out. And the reason for that was is that it, there was a big concern uh, and in many years leading up to the Vioxx settlement where there were global settlements, defense lawyers didn't think about this problem and, and a plaintiff's lawyer would pull out his two or three strongest cases and continue litigating in those because the plaintiff's lawyer thought they were blockbusters. Now I think if you go back and look at some of those cases, some were losers, they weren't the blockbusters that every plaintiff's lawyer thought they were, but the plaintiff's lawyer thought they were or they had a blockbuster case that was being litigated in state court and they liked their home court jurisdiction. So, the, the, so it was you could continue forward but you had to waive your fee interest in that case. That raised a couple issues. I don't think anybody felt sorry for the lawyer that would have to wa waive their fee interest. The issue was where does that leave the client? Is the client now prejudiced by the fact that they lose their lawyer? And the way we got to a solution on this, and Sam was involved and, and other people that we trusted their judgment on, is that there was a, we had tried 18 or 19 of these cases in Vioxx. There was a fully developed trial program with experts that were in the can, uh, deposition testimony, clips from trials. We had put that together. So it wasn't going to really be difficult for that particular plaintiff to go get another lawyer. And the committee was under an obligation to give that trial kit, that's what we called it, to the new lawyer. So we didn't think that there was gonna be any prejudice at all. In fact, we probably figured that the client would come out ahead because he wouldn't have two attorneys to pay. Um, but, so that, so that raised all kinds of issues um, for the settlement and I, I know at one point the New Jersey, um, oh, I forgot, but New Jersey Law Journal, the editorial board, Sam, if you remember, you had to go, we had to go meet with them and exp they wanted to work through some of these issues because they were gonna pan the settlement and ultimately, concluded that, that there was no problem. Look, the biggest, the biggest problem here on the ethics side is that if you go through the, the model rules or, or whatever rules you wanna follow, there is nothing out there right now designed to deal with um, these large MDL cases. They're all designed for really single incident cases, if anything, or a one-on-one -on -one relationship between the attorney and the client. So they don't anticipate a lot of the issues that are gonna now, I don't know if that requires a revisiting of the rules, and, but, but I can tell you that I've slept very well at night believing that we didn't violate any ethical rules and in fact, never heard anything really come of it other than some complaints by mostly the lawyers that, oh, there was one thing I should mention before I pass it off. The, the, the ultimate safety valve I think that we built in to avoid any ethical issues is that if an attorney could maintain a fee interest or could continue to go forward settling the case for all these clients except for the one or two that pulled out. And if Merck at that time in Vioxx had a concern about whether they were cherry picking or trying to game the system, that issue went before Judge Fallon and Judge Fallon ultimately made the ruling. Now, there were two or three instances where Merck felt that was being done. It went to Judge Fallon. Judge Fallon looked at the merits and concluded 
that they were not, in fact, trying to game the system and that it was, you know, their client legitimately didn't want to be in the settlement for whatever reason, um, and that attorney was able to go on and continue representing that person. But, but the concerns that were being dealt with, the, the bigger concern was, to, is, was not to allow people to, to game the settlement in any way that would be inappropriate, so. Chris, this whole area um, has been known as quasi-class actions. There's a ton of stuff in the academic literature yeah. on it, but almost nothing in the subcommittee record. Why aren't people talking about this in yeah. the committee? That, that's, that's, really, uh, that's really interesting. So I brought, so I went back and thinking about the quasi-class action issue. Now, Ken may remember this because the first case I could find where a judge referred to an MDL settlement, an aggregate settlement, as a class action was Judge Weinstein in the Zyprexa litigation, which was uh, one of the early cases that I had an opportunity to lead. The problem in Zyprexa that I, I had identified and with other people in the leadership was it was an antipsychotic medication, so it involved a pretty vulnerable population that had mental issues. In those days, it was very common for a defendant to go law firm to law firm and settle their cases. And then the lawyers would do the allocations of the amounts themselves for their clients. I was concerned about that in a case like that. So we went to Judge Weinstein and said, we don't want anything to do with the allocations. We would like you, court, to take this over and appoint a special master. He brought Ken in, and Ken can talk about his experience in it. But the judge, um, in that instance, to get to where I guess he wanted to go, wrote an opinion, and he called the, um, the Zyprexa settlement a quasi-class action. But I think his analysis is interesting because Judge Weinstein's view of what a quasi-class action was going to be is not really the way it went. I mean, he saw himself as taking total control of what was ultimately a private agreement. Now, other judges in Guidant, Judge Fallon in Viox, and many other judges have followed suit and have called aggregate settlements quasi-classes, but they've really done that solely for the purpose of applying Rule 23 principles to the allocation of attorney's fees and taking control of the attorney's fees. But Judge Weinstein had a lot more, I think, in mind, and I'll tell you why. He justified it and basically said it's, it's similar in many respects to, to a class action. His analysis basically was because, and it should be treated like a class action, and the court should take responsibility for it because of the large number of plaintiffs subject to the same settlement matrix, the utilization of special masters appointed by the court to control certain aspects of it, the court's order approving and controlling a huge escrow fund, which wasn't really what they had. I mean, we had a qualified settlement fund, but we needed the court to sign an order. He viewed that as him having control of the fund. Uh, and, 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 and a host of other things. But it was clear when I go back and read this, at the time, we were very thankful that he took this over. But I didn't, when I'm going back and reading this, I realize now that I think he had something even bigger in mind than just controlling attorney's fees. So. Sure. Now you don't hear much mention of the quasi-class because I think as a convention, it has become so widely accepted. Judges are just taking control of attorney's fees, approving them, and doing other things, um, and intervening where they see necessary, even in non-class settlements. But I, don't, I haven't seen much written on the quasi-class. Well, what about a Rule 23.3 <laughs> would have a whole set of procedures for MDLs? I mean, there's no reason not to do this. I mean, so one really quick point, I don't mean to dominate this discussion, but it reminds me of so many things. When we got to the NFL case, and one of the first calls I made early on was to Sam, because the, it was clear to me that we're, there was no way the NFL was gonna settle the NFL concussion litigation as an aggregate settlement. They weren't going to settle the cases only of the players who manifested an injury and just wait around for others to sue because there's some latency involved in um, the injuries that result from concussions. It takes many years for the neurocognitive and neuromuscular diseases to set in. They needed to have global peace, and the only way that was going to happen was by the creation of what we did, a 65-year fund, funded inflation-adjusted awards, and um, a Rule 23 settlement. So I remember I called Sam, and I said, you think we can put this together? And his comment was, I think you read to me, or you were citing to me, I'm looking at you, Judge Sirica's concurrence in the Sullivan case, where he basically calls out for like a, either a Rule 23.3 or we have to lighten up the approval of, of what, you know, what we're doing. You're making it impossible for parties to settle these really large litigations and there needs to be a solution to it. Yeah, Chris, so. I think that's very interesting because NFL was one of the few um, personal injury type cases that has been settled as class action. I mean, after um, Fen Fen, 
I think there was a total movement away from class action settlements of personal injury cases. And NFL changed the, 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 the discussion, at least for me, uh, by approving that settlement, and uh, well, a lot of us here were involved in that settlement, right. uh, and worked very hard uh, to get the courts to look at it in the class action perspective and approve it, even though there were sort of futures, there were at least future injuries, uh, and uh, sort of it becomes a model, again, of what can be done on the class action auspices after, you know, I for one and others I think thought that class action was not a way to potentially go in personal injury cases. Yeah, I'm asked all the time, this is this is change things, and I say, I don't, I don't know if it's changed things, but there's no one size fits all. What it does do is it puts one more tool on the shelf to use if the, if the right facts line up for it, and that, that it, uh, there, what just somebody mentioned opioids, and uh, I just want to open up as a last subject for the panel. Uh, and this case, of course, has a little of everything for everybody. There's uh, AG lawsuits uh, in state courts. There are individual lawsuits in state courts. There's a huge MDL in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, there are all kinds of cases within that MDL, cases for municipalities and counties, cases uh, for uh, tribes, uh, cases for uh, neonatal class actions. There's even a couple of personal injury class actions. Uh, it's a smorgasbord of anything you can think of. And a lot of people in this room are very interested in how you could globally resolve a mass litigation uh, such as this. So I was wondering, Arthur, from your point of view, um, do you have any ideas of how class action can be used? Uh, uh, Sam's waiting for you to tell him how to do it. <laughs> No, once uh, the language of 23B3 is applied, it becomes very, very difficult to get predominance, superiority, opt-out, et cetera, et cetera. All of those safeguards in quotation marks were put in in 62-ish in order to grease the wheels for 23B3 over objections, primarily of defense interests. So either 23 gets revised to lighten up, which I think politically is an impossibility in 2018, both as a rulemaking matter and as a Supreme Court promulgation matter, or you end up with what you see in cases like uh, NFL, in which to some degree, the court really isn't doing the same rigorous analysis demanded by the Supreme Court in cases like Falcone, but they're doing a touch of wink, wink, nod, nod in the settlement environment. So if you've got a judge who is willing to wink, wink, nod, nod, you'll get it through. You'll get it through. But then you have the circuit and the big guys in the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, that's it. Girls. It's wonderful to get it through uh, a good district judge, a powerhouse like a Weinstein, but take a look at Jack, my dear friend, Jack's record in the Second Circuit. Not too good. Without even getting up to the, the recently reconstituted <laughs> Supreme Court. He's very proud of that record, by the way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Ken, do you want to say anything? Uh, I, I, the opioid thing, you, you, forget a separate claims program. There's not enough money in the world to fund mm -hmm. a separate claims program. And it's a very immature tort, actually. I mean, the difficulty with trying to come up with some sort of formula 
to compensate people, forget for a minute whether the courts would buy it with a wink wink, I have difficulty understanding at this stage of the opioid um, litigation how you could develop a contribution formula among manufacturers, wholesalers, retailers, doctors, intermediaries, to try and, and in their insurers, to try and come up with a program until, I guess, there are some cases tried and some determinations made as to who's liable and who's primarily responsible, and then maybe it begins to come together. But um, it's hard for me to see right now with the money you'd have to be talking about, how this can be done without serious congressional mm. assistance. And uh, so, I th like most people, I throw my hands up on that one at this time. Uh, and we, they haven't called Saul yet. <laughs> <laughs> but but you, just to be fair, uh, Sheila, if you remember that very first day in court with um, Judge Polster, he made that comment. He said, I have no clue why this case is here. I'm not even sure it should be here, but it's here. So, uh, so Chris, he said that, but then I read a transcript, so I wasn't there, I'm just watching from the yeah. outside. But I read a transcript where he said, hey, we gotta, I read a transcript where he said, hey, we've gotta resolve all this because there's a national crisis here, everybody come together, let's resolve it. And that's really interesting because that, when he talks like that, he sounds like you can, um, but, and that's a very different kind of a role than we see, we ordinarily expect from judges, even, the judges who are on the, I would say, you know, more adventuresome end of procedural experimentation like Weinstein. Well, you're right. Uh, so people were shocked by that statement, at least in my, you know, I think circle. he's dealing with the hand he was dealt, and I think he is thinking like Ken now that the case is there, but, but you is know. Is kind of dispute that maybe can't really I, I think, properly be resolved by court? I, I don't, <laughs> that could be the case. See, one thing I disagree with Ken on, I do think you could come up with a formula for contribution in a case like that. I do, th I also think, and you know, I, I'm involved in the case, uh, but I do think that trials might not in this one particular, because look, I, this is what I anticipate. Whatever, whatever claims survive the motions to dismiss that get to a jury, um, I don't think the defendants are gonna do very well. So what good is a trillion dollar verdict in a case where maybe all of them together can contribute you know, half of that? I don't know, Sheila, can you get half of that together? How about, 500 million? Uh, how about less Sheila's than pretty 10? good. She, can, she knows how to go after those carriers. <laughs> Even I don't have a little black bag that big. But the difficulty of this case, though, I will tell you, which, which deals with perception, is that when, whenever it gets to the point that there's a resolution, and if it's a settlement, it's going to be selling it because people will have to understand that all you're ending is the litigation. The problem and the crisis won't be solved by the litigation. It's just too big. Well, so. it's not a, because the, the crisis is not about prescription drugs. The crisis oh yeah, it is. is I, about I beg fentanyl. to differ on that one. The, the, <laughs> and the you crisis. should not, you should be quiet on this one because your clients created the, that the, market. The, the, cri <laughs> the, 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 the crisis, doctors created the market. The, the crisis uh, is about fentanyl. Yeah. Nothing the, can cure that crisis except yeah. the federal government. People are dying because fentanyl is coming into this country from Be China and because Mexico. Because they can't afford your client's In drug once they get hooked on it, so they go to heroin there, after that. There's, there's, Look, there's, the truth is. Go ahead, Rather, tell us the, the truth. The truth, here's the truth. <laughs> you know, opioids, it's a monster. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But if you look back, there's always a crisis. Now, it may be a mini crisis, mm -hmm. NFL, mm -hmm. is in a sense a mini crisis, but there was a sense we got to do something about concussion, concussions in what some people, not me, consider to be our national pastime. Mm -hmm. uh, moving back, you could have said Vioxx was a crisis. You could say asbestos was a crisis. You could, and Elizabeth can attest to this, tobacco was a crisis. And tobacco, we should remember, ran up to the Fifth Circuit. And as usually happens in the Fifth Circuit, you hit a brick wall. So we went around the Fifth Circuit. There's always going to be a crisis. And you can either say, you know, this is too big. It, it, the system, the judicial system, can't handle it. 
And in some cases, maybe the system can't handle it. That doesn't mean you don't try to handle it and hope that you get mana from heaven in the form of attorneys general coming in in the form of Congress. I think we still have a Congress <laughs> doing something. I mean, you just, you just do what you can with the tools as imperfect as they are that you have. And that's opioids once again. I, I think and there'll be something after opioids. I think we're going to hear a lot more about this uh, in the rest of the program. Uh, we would like to open it up to the audience. Uh, you have an incredible panel here. They'll take questions on, on anything they talked about or anything that you have in your mind. So um, can't see. There's a microphone there. So any, any questions for anyone? Could ask Arthur about the opera even. <laughs> I'm stuck over here, so you may not be able to see me. Watch out for your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please do. Um, I wanted to ask a, a, a question and frame it with Holmes's statement about the, the felt necessities of the time to pick up on Ar Arthur's point that there's always something, but you don't know what the next thing is going to be and you don't know how big it's going to be, and you don't know exactly what the, the, the desiderata in that thing will be. So when Chris said, for example, that what NFL would want is peace, it wouldn't just be enough to do a pickoff one by one. You'd need to be sure that the resolution was certain and would bind everyone into the future. Well, to my question, how do you come up with rules that will answer that? I mean, if, if that's what drives all of this, the felt necessity of each crisis, each type of dispute, each sprawling uh, incident, it, it almost seems to me as though, as someone who is involved in the rules process on the bankruptcy side, this isn't what the rules really can answer. The rules might give you some tools to start framing things, but the rules can never give you that. We, we always seem to fall into two camps. There are the people that say you need a rule for everything, and then there are people that say it's okay to improvise. And I'm not, so I guess the question is, so what is the magic of the rule? Is it, is it a distrust of the, and I'm not asking this to you, Troy, but I'm saying, what, I don't really ultimately understand the push all the time for, you can't have a quasi-class because it's not permitted under the rules, or you can't do this or that. Judges and lawyers improvise all the time. So what is the problem with that? I mean, and, and just allowing it to develop. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I think the, you know, your question sort of makes me think of jazz, so we can improvise within a constraint. And I think that's how the rules are supposed to be structured. That is, there's a, there's, they have some constraining aspects, but within them there's a ton of judicial discretion to do the kind of improvising that Chris is talking about. Uh, the thing, and I would love to hear what Bob thinks about this. Um, I th so I think that the idea is if that basic form or structure um, works for the social problem that you are addressing, then I think um, that then I think you can make it work. So NFL, I think, might be an example. Um, I haven't studied it so carefully as to be able to actually say on my own whether it is, but it could be an example of I have a social problem. Rule 23, um, going through this process has solved that social problem, right? Whereas opioids may be something that's, that's less amenable because it's so sprawling to a kind of, hey, let's tie this up in a package and hand it to you and now it's all set. It may, be, it may require a more iterative process like the mature mass tort uh, that, that um, now his name is escaping me, but that Arthur mentioned. What's the name of the guy who invented that phrase? McGovern. McGovern, right? McGovern. So that yeah. idea that we actually need things to evolve over time. We'd love to wrap it all up right away, but maybe it's not possible. So what I think is so interesting about the desire for rules um, is that it's almost like it, you, it, you want the rules to give you something that no rule can really give you because it depends, as you're saying, on the nature of the social problem. But that doesn't mean that something about the structure can't allow us to riff off existing rules in a way that we can still say, oh, we can still identify it as, okay, that's jazz, it's not opera, I know what that is, right? And, and so it's within that sort of general constraint. That was yeah. the theory in 38. Yeah. But of course, 38 is a different society, a different culture. And it's come under 
it was it was the theory in '66, even though '23 got a little heavy for political reasons. When I was reporter, I remember I remember as if it was yesterday when I was named reporter. Charlie Wright, my senior co-author, said to me, "Less is more." Do not amend the rules unless there is a real problem that cannot be handled by competent attorneys and competent judges. And now I look at the rules, and there is so much garbage in the rules that, that is retrospective. Now, come on, Bob, do we need 23 G and H? The, the publishers need it because they can charge more for the supplements. Just. Look, do you, do, you, do you want something that reads like the Constitution or parts of the Constitution, or do you want a Talmud? Well, let, you know, right now we have a tax code moving toward a Talmud. Let's get Gad and then Bob, okay? Go ahead. Sorry? Ken, you wanted to say something, I've, Bob? I've always been rather quizzical and surprised at, 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 when it comes to aggregation, why there isn't a feeling of more respect that the trial judge can handle this. Mm, right, I agree. I mean, I, I, w w when, when people criticize aggregation or they criticize an MDL as, as cases aren't similar, whatever happened to the notion that um, Weinstein or Breyer or any other judges in this country, district judges, have the tools to review the state of the aggregation, the state of the, of the settlement, the state of the controversy, and rule. And yet, more and more I read about how well the, it's out of control as if the trial judge is no longer equipped to deal with the very problems that result in controversy and rulemaking. And those are the same people that are now and saying you, that they want to take interlocutory Bob appeal of everything first, a judge Chris. does in the first. <laughs> Bob, yeah. yeah, you're going to let me get that out, Jill. Yeah. <laughs> well, one answer to your question where I think the rules can make a difference is who ultimately decides about the innovation. I, I would say Rule 23F was a sea change in terms what? of shifting to the Court of Appeals the authority to make decisions on whether these innovations are correct or not. Um, and this is going to be the big issue. I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but the big issue that the defense bar is putting forward in the rules process is to create a Rule 23F to basically cover all of the things that come up in MDLs, uh, discretionary appeals, and, and even mandatory appeals for denials of summary judgment and things like that. So I think that's an area, even if you think trial judges should have a lot of innovation, to what extent can the appellate courts get involved early on? Now, let's now, add two to four going? more years to every, the processing that's of every well, I'm case. I'm not saying it's a good I'm idea. Stop. I'm just yeah. saying Thank that's you. an I need issue. Extra minutes. Whether or not they will. Yeah. And by the way, look at state courts where they allow that type of interlocutory appeal. And look how long some of the, you know, the cases go on for. Uh, I, I, for one, and was one of the proponents when I was on the advisory committee for, and, and Elizabeth was, I think, involved also, when the advisory committee was looking at having different rules for settlement classes. Because, you know, when you're talking about trying to get global resolution, if you put settlement classes through the same prism as regular classes, they're hard to get through. That's why NFL is really a watershed because it did get through. Uh, and uh, probably if you took a really hard look at that under 23 and it wasn't a settlement class, it likely would never have been a class. So, so there could be rules that could help with regard to global resolution, but at the same time, it can't help the structure that in the end comes out. It could just be some rules of the, of the road that could make the process at least more knowable rather than judge to judge. Um, we're, we've run out of time. I want to thank the panel. One more. Um, one more. I think we, have, we have some more? Okay, we can take another question. Hi, so a number of you have mentioned the case at a time quality to developing these resolutions. And I guess this is mostly a question for Chris and Sheila. Um, the thought I had was, is there enough authority in the MDL statute 
to do what you want to do. If you, right, if, uh, if you wake up tomorrow morning and someone comes up with a, a brilliant solution to the opioid crisis, does 1407 give the court what it needs to work that out? Or is, or is all this, as Arthur says, happening with sort of a wink and a nod to the limits of the transferee court's authority? I don't think 1407 gives uh, the judge the tools to get a global settlement. For that, we have to look at other tools, either through class action settlement, bankruptcies, or other uh, ways of doing it, all 14 of All you get from the MDL panel is the case gets there. And then right. the judge creates the rules with the plaintiff and defendant's lawyers helping the judge based on, on their past experience. So that gives no ability to get a global resolution or for any of the rules of the game. It just gets made up as you go along uh, based on the relationship of the plaintiffs and the defendants' committees and based on what the judge and now in this case lots of special masters are going to decide. No, I, no, I completely, uh, completely agree with it. I mean, if you go and look at the Zyprexa decision, Judge Weinstein thought that centralization was an important factor in and of itself, but yeah, I agree with you, Sheila. There's nothing specific about 1407 other than that's where the cases go. Any other questions? That we have? Okay, we'll give you a little time. One more? Yeah. Okay. Last, last question. Hi, my question is about, we, we, you spoke about how it's it's now common for there to be transition in the cases. For example, it starts as a class action, then it moves on to an MDL, then bankruptcy, and so on and so forth. So my question is, do you suggest, is there a mechanism that the firms use? Or I guess my question is, is it better to be a jack of all trades as, a, as an attorney or a firm, or is it better to build into the cases a system of transition between attorneys or firms if such a transition does in fact take place as the case moves along. I think Professor Lahav made a really good point about how these things are all interrelated. So if, you're gonna, if you were to get involved in this field and look to, you know, you're gonna have to know enough about each of those areas. Where they really come into play is where, like it was pointed out before, like in the opioid litigation where it is conceivable that some defendants won't survive the litigation, so there'll be a bankruptcy aspect. How will that interrelate with if some of the case settles as a class action? And maybe some cases at the end may not settle as a class, maybe something left that you may want to settle in an aggregate model. So yeah, you have to become a little bit of a jack of all trades. Okay, once again, I'd like to thank this panel. I hope we started off with a bang and thank you all.